Well, in Washington over the weekend, rehearsals were underway ahead of the first state visit for an Australian Prime Minister since George W. Bush hosted John Howard at the White House in 2006. Now, there's been other visits, of course, Kevin Rudd, Julia Gillard, Tony Abbott and Malcolm Turnbull, but they were working visits or official visits. A state visit is another step up altogether, especially for this president who does this pomp and ceremony only on rare occasions. Indeed, when President Trump hosts the Prime Minister for a state dinner at the White House on Friday, it will be the only the second such state dinner for a visiting head of government since Donald Trump was elected. After their dinner, the Prime Minister will travel to Ohio to tour at the new Pratt Industries paper recycling mill, accompanied by the President. Now, to my mind, getting the President on the road with an Australian Prime Minister to visit an Australian business, that's the real coup. Forget the dinner. Before the PM then, we'll go on to Chicago for business and investment related events. Joining me tonight to fill in for my usual guest, Dennis Shanahan, and to cover off the US visit and the headlines out of Parliament today is National Political Editor at the Herald Sun, James Campbell. James, are you heading off to Washington at the end of the week? No, no, I didn't get the chocolates. Uh, ah. It wasn't my, it wasn't our turn. The, the Adver Adelaide Advertiser will do a splendid job covering it off for the News Corp tabloids from yeah, there. Well, I'll be here. Paul Murray will, of course, be uh, over there in Washington. What I found extraordinary, and I said it there in my intro, yes, it's lovely to have the dinner, and it is a state dinner, not an official dinner or a working dinner, and they're all different grades of, of protocol. But getting Trump to go to Ohio where the Pratt Industries, a very proud Australian company based out of Melbourne and in New York, is opening up a new recycling mill and that's uh, many, many jobs in what I'd call Rust Belt United States. That's the real coup, getting, getting the president on the stump, on the hustings with the Prime Minister and that's unusual for Trump. Absolutely. Um, Ohio is, of course, uh, historically a swing state. It's a very important state. It's a state that uh, uh, Trump carried. Uh, there are deep and historic links between the Liberal Party in Victoria anyway and the Ohio Republicans. Um, it's, it, it's, you know, it, a factory, Midwest. Uh, these are the sort of pictures that uh, Trump wants to have uh, lots of before he gets re-elected next year, if he does get re-elected. Uh, so it's a, it, it is a, it's a trip of convenience for him, uh, you know, convergence of interests, I might, I might say. Uh, but it is also a, a sign of the deep favour uh, in which Australia is held by the Trump White House in, and in Washington generally. Uh, as Americans will tell you, they don't have very many genuine friends uh, and we're one of them. So when we come, we get, we get very good treatment. And I suspect, you know, obviously one of the issues will be Iran. There are events over the weekend. Uh, we have Australians being held, as we know, in Tehran. Uh, and also, on the back of Osmin, which was only held in Australia recently, you would expect talks with Mike Pompeo and others. What else do you think will be on the agenda while they're in these states? Well, front and centre, of course, I think, in, in, will, be, will be China. Uh, it's impossible to have any sort of discussion at all uh, with, the United, with anyone from the official America uh, without that coming up. Um, they've been uh, following uh, the events in Australia over the last couple of years with great interest. Um, in a sense, we're the, we're, the, we're the canary in the coal mine around the Western world on foreign interference. Uh, the, the rot has probably gone further here uh, amongst the diaspora Chinese and it's gone in other parts of the world and it's a larger percentage of the population here than it's been other parts of the world. And we're the first country in the world that's really had a go uh, through legislation at trying to roll it back. Uh, and, you know, uh, and someone, you take someone like Clive Hamilton, uh, when he goes to the US now, he gets the, the red carpets rolled out for him all around all the institutes and think tanks in Washington because they're very, very interested in what's been going on here. They, um, they were worried for a while, uh, you know, with our deep uh, economic dependence on the United States that we were in danger of, of slipping out of their orbit. We were in danger of turning into a sort of a Finland uh, of the Southeast Asia. But I think... The way, the way in which we've really pu pulled back on this in the last couple of years uh, with support of you know, both sides of Parliament, mm. I think has impressed the United States. All right, well, let's stay on the issue of China. We ended last week with uh, a lot of concerns raised out of an interview uh, with our colleague Andrew Bolt between he and Gladys Liu at the start of the week. 
basically just asking for, I would call, background information and they're less than genuine responses. Some say clumsy, some say a little bit more organised than that. Her responses kicked off a whole debate throughout the week. It wasn't a great week for the government. They had set up a debate about welfare and a whole range of other bread and butter issues, but instead went down this cul-de-sac of China. And it comes at a time where there's a lot of uh, interrogation at ICAC over evidence from the New South Wales Labor Party uh, about China as well, albeit it's about property donations. It's got a lot of China links in and around all of that. What happened today in relation to Gladys Liu on the back of uh, donations that were talked about over the weekend, not properly or adequately disclosed? Well, in Parliament today, the opposition did not really attempt to ask any substantive issues on this. They focused their questions on whether or not the Prime Minister had or had not used the phrase Shanghai Sam. Now, this followed on from the last week where they asked a whole lot of questions that were intended to be ruled out of order. I think Labor is in two minds about this. They don't really know what to do about it. Um, there are those who, like, who think that they should press on in this because they sense that they could potentially get a, a, a political kill. And there are those who have taken the Prime Minister's warning to heart that there are 1.2 million Chinese Australians uh, who might not take it well if they would have lose political blood on their hands. So I think that a lot of what Labor's been doing in Parliament has been theatre to try and convince the press gallery that they're really interested in a subject that they really don't want to talk about very much. All right, well, you're well connected in Victoria on both sides of politics. Is there something that needs to be pursued here, do you think? Are there questions that remain unanswered? Yes. In short, I think there are. I think that there are... I think that... We, I, th I suspect in the next few days uh, we're going to see a lot more of the same. Uh, I think that, it, frankly, anybody who's raised a million dollars, as Gladys Liu boasted she had done uh, in the past, and largely from Chinese sources, is going to have raised them from a lot of the people uh, uh, about whom there are questions. And I suspect that the, the work that's going on now is that people are doing all over the place is burrowing into that. Um, and we just have to sort of watch this space. I can't really sort of... I don't really want to telegraph No, no, and I, look, I understand that. You're working for a newspaper that yeah. probably wants a scoop if it could get one. I suspect, having worked inside government and opposition, both sides of politics, uh, the Liberals will be trying to see uh, what Absolutely. is the extent of the issues there with Gladys Liu. Do they know everything that they have been told is accurate? There'll be a lot of work being done there. And, of course, Labor will be looking uh, for a scalp, or at least they'd be hoping for a by-election if she was to disappear uh, from the Parliament. Reports also today, and this, this highlights the whole China issue, reports today that there was a hack of our parliamentary system uh, by the Chinese, now not confirmed by the government, never is. It's always about a state actor or a non-state actor. Uh, how serious has that been taken in Canberra today? Well, I think it's around here it's been known that this happened. And, and, and we should remember this is the second time Parliament systems have been hacked by the Chinese. There was a hack back in 2011 at which the Chinese uh, state agents was sitting inside the parliamentary system for more than a year. Uh, that only came out... The full details on that only came out in 2017. And, and from my inquiries into that hack, I asked, well, what have they got from that? And it was I was told pretty well they've got everything. Uh, they would have got everything out of the system and it would be sitting there. What, what it means and what they make of it uh, maybe some, may, may take years to emerge. So... Um, this most recent one is really... They just came back for more. Um, and it underlines the fact that, uh, you know, if you talk to anybody uh, who has uh, clearance to read the, you know, intelligence clearance in this space, you say, how bad is it? And they say, it's as bad as it could be. Uh, we are constantly uh, under um, attack, uh, uh, you know, from chi agents of chi Chinese espionage. It's just a, it, it's just a fact of life that we uh, live with. It's concerning... Uh, that in the sort of seven or eight years since the last one, we apparently... You know, they were still able to get in, but I suppose, you know, technology moves on, attack and defence move on. Yeah, I think it's a real concern, uh, particularly if they can get into the Parliament House network. There's a lot of communications that go up from senior public servants to parliamentarians. There's the work of committees uh, that are not necessarily on uh, networks that are as secure as our security ministers' networks are. So I think that's that, to me, is a real concern. 
Uh, this issue of an oil attack over the weekend and, uh, you know, already today we've had an almost 10% spike in the price of oil in Australia. Uh, we don't explore much for oil anymore. We certainly don't have much onshore drilling uh, in this country. There's all the issues with uh, coal seam gas, sure, but oil exploration in the great state of Victoria is banned under the Labor government. And we also have a loss of refining capacity. Now, Jim Molan has long argued we need to do better. I did listen to some crocodile tears from Labor saying, you know, this is a real problem. We should have more oil supplies uh, in Australia. But I have to say, I remember a briefing back in 2013, not long after the coalition was elected, and the state uh, that the oil reserves had been left by Labor was parlous. So I think both sides of government here need to do better, or both sides of politics. Where do we go from here? Because Australians aren't going to cop an increase uh, both to supply, but also the national security implications of not having enough fuel and avgas. Australia has one of the world's busiest corridors. I think it's number two in the world, Sydney to Melbourne. But we have to start grounding flights uh, because we haven't got our act together in terms of domestic supply, that'd be a pretty shocking circumstance. Absolutely. I mean, to be fair to Labor, they did go to the uh, election with a policy of, uh, of, of increasing the, the nation's um, fuel reserves. What, however negligent they may have been in the past, Shorten was very much alive to this issue and, and, and uh, went out there and raised it uh, earlier this year when nobody else was talking about it. Uh, I mean, I think, I mean, obviously it's a big problem for us. We are a trading nation that sits at the end of a very long supply lines uh, at the bottom of the world. So not only do we have, um, uh, we don't produce enough to supply ourselves, we're also, um, you know, particularly acutely vulnerable to, to interruption because we are, you know, so at the end of, uh, of sea lanes, which are becoming increasingly contested. I mean, it was interesting today that Neither the, the government didn't ask itself a Dor Dorothy Dixer on the Iran situation, and the opposition didn't ask them a question either. I mean, I would have thought that uh, what happened overnight in Saudi Arabia is a very, very serious escalation of what has been a deteriorating situation now for some months. Uh, we've seen uh, a British oil tanker seized by the Iranians. We've seen a uh, people who have been arrested in Iran on trumped up charges who are there on holiday, who are essentially now being held as hostages. Uh, the Iran is, is suffering uh, from the sanctions that the United States have imposed on it in the months since they walked away from the uh, uh, nuclear agreement. And their economy is in a very bad way and they are punching, you know, they are punching to try and um, you know, put, put pressure on the United States to, to back down. This attack on Saudi Arabia, essentially crippling 50 per cent of the, in, in the short term at least, 50 per cent of, of the Saudi Arabia, the swing oil producers' uh, capacity is out of action at the moment. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to see how the United States cannot retaliate in, in kind. They, uh, Pompeo's come out and said that they hold Iran wholly responsible for this. That's They're right. not buying the line that these are, uh, uh, you know, y Yemeni tribesmen who's managed to get hold of a drone or whatever the official line is from Iran, that they, they say, no, this is you, uh, what are they going to do? Because if they respond in kind, it's going to have a... Uh, we're going to see a, a, a spiralling impact on world oil prices. There are limited people that the Iranians can presently sell oil to who will take it, but uh, if they're knocked out, uh, then, you know, th then the, whoever... Who, who they sell to will be, will, in, will be in the world market. Now, the United States has the capacity... Uh, because they've had some foresight here to uh, have large royal reserves that they can turn on if things go, uh, you know, go really bad. But when it, th this is um, this is this is a real a real Rubicon has been crossed overnight with with this attack on Saudi Arabia, and it, 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 it you know it also highlights the vulnerability of fixed you know oil assets uh, in, in, in in all around the world to, to fairly. Uh, low tech Correct. these days, well, not low tech, but point. easily obtained, yep. e easily obtained uh, technology. I mean, you know, it doesn't take much more than a, than a drone you can buy, you know, David Jones or Meyer uh, kitted up in the right way to do enormous damage. So this wasn't so, a sophisticated yep. attack. I agree with you, James. This, is, this shows you in the supply chain 
there's choke points all the way through now. Some of them are seaborne choke points. Uh, in this case, it was uh, pipeline infrastructure, but it shows you the vulnerability of... Uh, and our vulnerability, I have to say, as a country, our utter dependency on what's coming out of some pretty hotspot regions of the world, unlike the United States, which has done a lot of onshore exploration in their own country, where they have now much more domestically-based security about energy supplies than they've ever had before, we in Australia are going the other way. We've got all of these resources. We're not using them. We're not drilling for them. We're not looking at them. What, we've, what little where we've got, coal and gas and other things, we're shipping uranium. We're shipping offshore for others to use. We're impoverishing ourselves. And we're now also susceptible to these political hotspots, as I said. But it's all OK because uh, Julie Bishop today has put up her hand, not quietly, to the government, to colleagues that she's got all of their mobiles to say, look, if you need my help, I'll happily quietly behind the scenes help you sort things out. But Julie Bishop's put her hand up publicly through the media to say she'll step back into the breach, so, mate, it's all OK. It's great. She looked, look, she looked magnificent in the scarf when she went over there a few years ago. Clearly, she's got him in the wardrobe and she's good to go. She's ready to strap it on the head and head over to sort this problem out. That's just... How could we say look, no? I, I do, yes, you know, I could be a bit facetious here on her magnanimity, but, but look, it is a good thing that where we have extended links with retired MPs and Prime Ministers, that we use them. But I have to say, uh, you know, I call rubbish on this to put it in the media and not do it quietly. Uh, I know of an instance a couple of years ago when there was an Australian jailed in China, and a couple of instances actually, uh, former Prime Ministers and Ministers of both sides of politics quietly used all of their networks without anybody knowing about it. So it does happen has happened in the past and I think it'll happen in the future. But to run it out in the media, I think it embarrasses uh, Maurice Payne, but if they thought Julie would be helpful, they perhaps might have contacted her earlier too. Well, that, but also, I mean, it, it, if she were to go over there and sort of get involved in this stuff, one, one, you're reminded of all of those retired politicians who went over to, you know, speak to Saddam Hussein uh, in the early 90s to try and get hostages released. And then it just... It, it hands... Uh, what is essentially a pariah regime, uh, a priceless uh, public relations victory. Um, it, it, this is perhaps an occasion in which people ought to keep their mouths shut, I suspect. Yeah, all right. Well, we'll leave it there. So I don't know that uh, Julie Bishop will take either of our advice, but there you go. James, you did a very good job stepping in for Dennis Shanahan. Thank you very much. Thank you and, very much. And good luck for the rest okay. of the parliamentary week.